and welcome to this episode of season four of the Dr. Tech Show, where myself, Pauline Roach, and Swain Hunter, and often guests, talk about digital topics, including the world of online communications and digital inclusion, in a show which was the brainchild of digital storyteller, the late John Popham. So, weather report, Swain, how is the weather where you are? And you're on mute. I'm on mute. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. The weather is lovely for the time of year. Bright sunshine. Uh, we're, I think we're in between two stormy periods. So we've had huge amounts of wind and cancelled ferries and all sorts of things here in Orkney um, over the past week or so. But today's lovely and there's more bad weather on its way. So that's just the time of year we're in, I suppose. How about you? Um, it has, I've had blue skies in Birmingham. Not today, unfortunately, but uh, no rain predicted. So just white clouds and uh, bright it's bright so, and i've been out for already oh, that's so, good that's good uh, yeah can testify that it's a it's a nice bright day in birmingham so thanks thanks for that for good that. good okie doke so some dates we've got um we know it's the middle of october but uh, it's still black history month and we will be kind of going back a bit as well into last week but we weren't, weren't on last week so we'll refer to some of the things we've missed and catch up with them so the first one is black history month um in october uh we obviously want every year of the month really to be black history day uh, month but anyway m october is the one where people do um extra special things for um black history and black futures um and in this one we picked out uh, a story about an interview with chian wara the labor mp for newcastle upon tyne central currently undertaking the role of Shadow Minister of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And she talks in this interview about uh, being an MP, AI and the power of voice. She considers herself to be a tech evangelist, having worked in the tech sector for 20 years before coming into Parliament. Um, as, an, as an MP, she has sought to champion technology and how it can make, use, make, make all of our lives better. But unfortunately, the sector remains a preserve of a narrow demographic. Just 4% of the tech workers are Black, Asian or minority ethnic. And just 3% of females say the career in tech is their first choice. Uh, since she's entered Parliament, she has worked to ensure that science and technology must be representative of all of society if it's to work for all of society. Um, she's saying that diversity, diversity is not a nice to have tick box, and it's not a necessity. And without it, innovation is stifled and valuable talent is excluded from the workforce. Think about the technology we could have had, we would be enjoying now if STEM represented humanity instead of a narrow subject, subsection of it. She also chairs the APPG, All-Party Parliamentary Group for Diversity and Inclusion in STEM, which works to identify the reasons for the lack of diversity and inclusion in STEM and ways in which to address it. They need to be at the heart of our STEM education, employment practices, policy development and digital economy if we are to thrive, that is diversity and inclusion. And she uh, reminds us that one of the reasons for the gender pay gap is that STEM jobs pay better. So... Um, agree with all of that in fact uh, Swain I've just come from the um, Birmingham Tech Week Tech Leadership Breakfast this morning um, in, in Birmingham City Centre at HSBC offices where um, a lot of those messages were being repeated by uh, people including Paul Scully the, um, the um, Minister um, for Tech and Digital the Tech and Digital Economy He's the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State and the Department of Science Innovation and Technology so it was good to hear him um, echoing uh, and, and she, she and him speaking uh, the same language there. So um, yeah, good to good to hear those messages being repeated everywhere we go. Lots of things on during Birmingham Tech Week, by the way, for anyone who's in Birmingham. Um, so visit the website and see what else is on. And I hope to catch up with my colleagues from there again later in the week. We also had um, actually, if I, uh, I can just say, we had um, Martin Ward, the West Midlands Tech Commissioner, speaking um, on what's next for the region's tech sector and revealing plans of how the West Midlands um, can become a global tech hub, including a one million pound investment um, uh, by TechWM uh, into the tech sector. And I'm hoping some of that will come towards the tech for good sector, which I'm involved in, Swain, as you know. OK, so is that the is that the. Um, is he the commissioner under the. Greater combined West Midlands combined, combined that's the word combined yes, authority, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, so is, it's Birmingham yes. and lots of other bits of the West Midlands. Yes, absolutely. Yes. The whole okay. of the region. Yeah. Yeah. So he's a very engaging person. And uh, maybe we'll get him on the show sometime yeah. to talk about Great. what he's planning to do. I'm sure he'd be delighted. I did ask uh, somebody else at the event if they would join us on the show, and they said yes. So hoping to have more guests for you um in the next coming weeks. 
Okay, the next event I picked up again was something that's already gone, but we, we thought was worth mentioning. Uh, the 2nd to the 6th of October uh, was Digital Inclusion Week in the US. And this is an annual week of awareness, recognition and celebration with support from the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Organizations and individuals across the US hold special events, run social media campaigns and share their digital inclusion actions and progress with media, among other, act uh, other actions. The, um, they say everyone deserves the opportunity to use technology to live, learn, work and thrive. And if you agree, you're invited to join them in at the beginning of October to promote digital equity in their community. And in 2022, 238 organizations, agencies, tribes and towns took action during Digital Inclusion Week. And we have a video, a six minute video we're going to show um, to give a flavor of what they um, are doing. And here it comes. Did you know that we are turning our digital equity moment into a movement? And we are advocating for digital equity for all, especially for all folks in Atlanta and across our state of Georgia. Welcome to Atlanta, y'all. Digital Inclusion Week. Hi, I'm Jesse Will Buyback, and I believe in digital skills for all. I believe that closing the digital divide is essential to economic prosperity. We need digital equity now. We're turning this moment into movement by partnering with dozens of you. And we're at the Oak Hill Collaborative, solving the digital divide by teaching classes and signing them up for the Affordable Connectivity Program. Digital equity is racial equity. We're transforming our digital equity moment into a movement by spreading awareness in the community. We're turning our digital equity moment into movement by advocating for older adults and people with disabilities who need accessible information and communications technology. Digital inclusion means digital skills for everyone. We want digital inclusion now. Participate in Digital Inclusion Week 2022. I believe that digital equity should be the new norm. I'm Kim Hunter-Reed, Commissioner of Higher Education for the state of Louisiana. I believe digital inclusion means digital skills for all. We're turning our digital equity moment into movement by providing opportunities for digital skill building in Louisiana's public libraries. Hi, I'm Jerry Yamashita, and here at Highlands Community Charter and Technical Schools, we believe digital equity should be our new norm. Inclusión digital significa habilidades para todos. Gunjonidene digital bamanoi internet barayhama. Inclusión digital enseamne acces la tecnologie pentru toate lumea. Digital equity is racial equity. Moya kat hoksan so yugatin mama gatino jenkolo yako. Mova ne povinna bute pereskode dla cifravih navichok. Cifravaya inclusia azначает gavrit na yazakah na katorak gavrat nashi uchiniki. We're turning our digital equity moment into a movement by raising awareness into our community. Uh, my name is Joshua Williams with Fuse Corps and the city of Houston, and I believe digital equity is racial equity. On behalf of all of Ramsey County, we believe we need to promote digital equity through our connectivity blueprint. I'm with the Nashville Public Library, and we believe that digital inclusion means digital skills for everyone. We believe in digital inclusion because access to technology and connectivity means our citizens can achieve their full human potential. Digital equity and inclusion means we are turning our digital equity moment into movement by digital skills for all, racial equity, broadband for all, providing access to technology to our community, providing access to equitable training. Digital inclusion means Louisville. We're building the digital equity movement by creating more welcoming spaces for people to develop digital skills. I believe digital inclusion means digital equity for all. Juanisha with Bite Back, and we're turning our digital equity moment into a movement by bridging the digital divide. I'm Denver Mayor Michael Hancock, coming to you from the Mile High City, and I believe we need digital equity now. And we believe digital equity means broadband and digital skills for all people. 
We're turning this digital moment into a movement, asking our students to reach out to their governmental representatives to encourage them to help us in this effort. Digital equity is a 21st century civil right. We've got to take this movement to help everyone get connected. Access to high quality internet can absolutely change lives. I believe digital inclusion means digital skills for everyone. We're taking this digital equity moment and turning it into a movement by educating community members of all ages to prepare them for the digital world. I believe we need digital equity now. ¿Qué significa inclusión digital para todos? Significa que nosotros los latinos podemos participar en la sociedad porque inclusión es poder. And we have a whole lot of veterans that are looking to help out. Together. We're going to refurbish and prepare a lot of mics together. Happy Digital Inclusion Week. We creo en la equidad digital porque es un modo de incluir a todos. Hi, we're the Hollywood Branch Library. We believe that digital inclusion means providing access to devices for everyone. Lending Chromebooks is our way of turning our digital equity moment into a movement. We're with the Capital Region Coalition for Digital Inclusion, turning our digital equity moment into movement through the Capital Region Digital Inclusion Portal. Hi, I'm Armando with Cardboard Project. I'm Joan with DIA. We believe that digital rights are human rights, and our work in the the community. I'm Rosanna with Inspire DU, and I believe digital inclusion means digital skills for all. We believe digital inclusion means digital skills for all. Digital equity should be our new norm. We're turning our moment into a movement by raising awareness in our community. We are turning our digital equity moment into movement by providing basic digital skills classes, affordable equipment, and access to affordable or free internet for our community members who need it most. I am Katie McKenna, founder of eTreasure Incorporated and author of Saving the Cell Phone Gets Thrown Away. We're turning our digital equity movement into movement by teaching children in our community the importance of digital football. I believe digital inclusion is amplifying underrepresented voices in Fresno. Digital equity is racial equity. Digital inclusion means access to devices for all. So, I think we've wow. got a good flavor of uh, everyone involved in that sort of thing. Lots of different backgrounds, lots of um, clips at various levels of uh, professional. That was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was really, really good. I hadn't watched it before the show, as you can tell. Mm. Oh, highlights 21st century civil rights, welcoming spaces. I need for welcoming spaces to gain digital skills, libraries, raw. Mm -hmm. um, the invitation to reach out to governmental reps and and um I particularly highlight like the that issue. one, yes. Yeah. And I love the <laughs> I, I there was there was a theme I think was it something like turning our moment turning into this a digital movement. moment into a movement or Definitely. into into movement even. Yeah. Yeah and digital rights or human rights all all the stuff. and I loved the veterans with their uh, yeah. handfuls of handfuls <laughs> of human rights. That was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we've all had a box like that <laughs> i was kind of wondering what they were going to pull out of that box but it was yeah. quite benign in the end so yeah was... <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that's amazing and it's just uh, you know it's full of kind of stereotypical american enthusiasm it's brilliant mm. and it just goes to show um how similar all the issues and aspirations and plans and schemes are mm -hmm. there to, to, yeah. to, to, to in the to in the various bits of the UK, so that's great. Yeah. yeah. So I look forward to a similar oh. um production next week, next year. By and the as you said, digital poverty lines, huh? Indeed, as you said uh before the show, um John would have loved the John Popham would have loved that. It's lots of real people's voices. Nobody's fussing about whether the sounds any good or whether the video is any good, or it's all about the message and about speaking your truth, as it were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really good, really mm -hmm. inspiring that one. Yeah, loved it. Yeah, I liked it. Give me big, give me a big smile on my face. So <laughs> give some of our readers and listeners uh, the same. 
Okay, we're pressing on, and uh, last week as well was another day uh, that we um, mention it usually, I think every year, World Mental Health Day on the 10th of October. And the theme for 2023 set by the World Foundation of Mental Health is Mental Health is a Universal Human Right. Uh, and the day is about raising awareness of mental health and driving positive change for everyone's mental health and a chance to talk about mental health, how we need to look after it, and how important it is to get help if you're struggling. And fortunately, more and more people are more open about, you know, having difficulties um, these days. I, mean, I know I've talked about my own mental health from time to time and um, yeah, getting help from each other and uh, kind of directing people towards good resources seems a, a good thing for us to do. Yes, sorry, I'm getting <laughs> my, my, my own computer mouse here without any veteran help. Yes, no, I, I similarly, uh, I, I've spoken about this in the past as well, and it's it's great. There's a day, it comes and it goes, but I think we've got another story about that later on, so mm. we can uh, we can maybe come back to it then. Yeah, cool. Okay, and then uh, one that I, again, had John's name written all over it, uh, 13th, 13th of October was Lo Local Radio Day. Hooray! And we may or may not have referred to this before, and we, and we I think um, regular listeners will know that the show is called the Dr. Tech Show because somebody in local radio in Leeds, was it Leeds? It was Leeds. John Dr. Tech, yeah. So um, we shout out for uh, Radio Leeds and um, thanks for giving us the name for this show. Um, so this day began in 2015 to highlight the value of local radio to communities and to celebrate the unique relationship between local broadcasting and listeners. It's organised by the Local Radio Alliance since 2019, an occasion to not only celebrate but also strengthen the connections that local radio brings to communities, to industry professionals, and to individuals. In recent years, local radio has achieved new heights of relevance. The need to unite during isolation, to join meaningful and supportive networks has never been greater. Local radio has proved an invaluable medium to facilitate such connections. And on screen, um, Swain is showing their website and other stories that, they, that have been covered by local radio all of which uh, we can kind of all refer to. So easy, Absolutely. easy reading for all of us to... I mean, in, in, in Orkney we're, and in Shetland, we're very lucky to have a hyper-local radio station, a BBC hyper-local ah. community station, as it's called. Uh, radio Shetland in Shetland, Radio Orkney in Orkney, uh -huh. as you would expect. Um, and they just broadcast... They've been, they've been going since, I think, about 1978, mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, and they were actually founded by the person who is now the director of the science festival. So that's a, ah, a, a theme, excellent. Howie yeah. Firth. Mm -hmm. uh, they broadcast a half hour uh, program every morning, a sort of news roundup program every morning as an opt out from Radio Scotland. And then uh, in the evening, there is uh, something in the summer, in, in the wintertime, not, they have a pause through the summer months, but they have a week, a set of weekly or monthly evening hour-long programs at uh, I think about six o'clock hmm. and one of the things that struck me about that and it, it, it applies to all the local radio stations even the bigger ones in England and and and, and the independent ones and you know even community radio like the the the, the Hope Radio that we used to contribute to in, in, in Birmingham when it was going the the arrival of the internet has massively increased what each of those stations can do if they mm. get it right mm. and I remember Radio Orkney was one of the first organizations to really get going with Facebook. And now that you can listen to the program at any time of day, it's only half an hour, remember, the, the main news one. And also the fact that they update their Facebook page with everything from uh, major news like funding news and community news, lost cats, uh, closed roads, you name it. Everything as they get it, as they yeah. clear, as they type it into the script for the next bulletin, they're updating Facebook. And that's become, I can remember when Radio Orkney years and years ago now got up to, I think it was 20,000 uh, likes on their mm -hmm. page. Mm -hmm. Because although quite a significant minority, uh, quite a si significant part of those people will not actually be resident in Orkney, that marked the point at which their Facebook audience was the size of the population of the <laughs> of the community it serves now lots of those people will be um orkney exiles and people who can't easily listen to an fm opt out on radio or on radio scotland within orkney and shetland 
and bits of caseness. But uh, the whole digital thing, it made, and, and they, they, they did it really well and really early. They kind of turned themselves inside out almost. And you could almost look at them as now, I mean, don't let's tell the BBC this, but you could almost look at them now as a digital thing, a digital organization that happens to have a radio program at, at, <laughs> in the morning. I mean, now that's not a way... I mean, the whole BBC has gone very digital over the years, mm -hmm. but or, or Radio Orkney was right there at the forefront of that, uh, as, as was Radio Shetland. And uh, it's one of the reasons why Orkney kind of, we say, it kind of runs on Facebook. Let's mm -hmm. hope Facebook doesn't crumble under us like certain other platforms have, because it would be a total disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's, that's a big that's long great, ramble. That's a great story. Well, but that's um, local radio. It's really close to my heart. Yeah, it sounds brilliant. Could would Howie join us on the show? Maybe I'm sure he would. Talk about I'm sure all he of would. that. That'd be fascinating. I'm sure he has stories. To I tell. don't know why he's not been on our list before now. <laughs> yes, let's add him to the list of people to contact and, and invite on. The other person, from that point of view, would, would be the person who took over from him. Um, well, it's many years now since Howie was the the producer of, of Radio Orkney. Mm -hmm. But the person who the, who was in charge uh, during the the digital Facebook renaissance at okay. that time was that was uh, someone called Dave Gray, uh -huh. and he's got an interesting story to tell as well about um, digital and his life and how things how things let's, work. Let's get them both on. That sounds like two get him shows. as two well. Yes, or we could have a panel. We could have a panel, and then we could mm, have a week off. We, yeah. we could just <laughs> chat to him. <laughs> <laughs> well let's let's work anyway on that yes see if we can get we're, we're now we're, brilliant we're, we're not in an editorial meeting now let's move on to another story yes, absolutely <laughs> uh well let's go on to our events and um we're on to this week now which is get online week 16 to 20th of october every year uh the good things foundation organized this um and have uh, an annual campaign uh, run by Digi leading digital inclusion charity Good Things Foundation, who power the National Device Bank, National Data Bank, Learn My Way, and the National Digital Inclusion Network, previously known as the Online Centres Network. Um, they remind us that 102 point, 100, uh, sorry, 10.2 million people in the UK lack the basic digital skills needed to use the internet, with millions still living without access to a data device or data to get connected. Unable to connect with loved ones, jobs and training opportunities and everyday services moving online, People are experiencing digital exclusion and are being left behind. This has caused a digital divide between those connected and those disconnected. So every year, Get Online Week, now in its 16th year, enables digitally excluded people to learn the essential digital skills needed to get online through free, friendly and fun local events. And on screen now, Swain has the map of um, Get Online Week events. I, and I think I'm just showing that I don't, I'm just showing you where I don't know. I don't know where Birmingham is. <laughs> <laughs> So where's Northfield? Is it north of uh, it south? North? No, go south, no. and one of those events will be Hill, um, there's at Hills Owen. Yeah, south again, and to your right or left, I don't know which. Yeah, there's a couple of pointers there. There yes, we are. There we go. Got bingo. Partnership on the nineteenth. Um, they're doing two events this week. One on ch tomorrow Tuesday with uh, Barclays Digital Eagles, and on Thursday. Uh, online safety and digital skills drop in, uh, which I'll be um, working out with my colleagues from Digital NNS. But as you can see, the whole of the UK and uh, Northern Ireland, uh, including Northern Ireland, and even um, our Orkney are hosting um, events. You've got a couple there. Um, it's the Spain. Learning Link uh, mm. in Strumness and the Orkney Scam Action Group, which is a great thing. It's a partnership mm -hmm. of various public. Encouraging people to come and speak with us about learning new things on digital devices and discussing online safety and alertness. It's not long till Christmas and many of us will be buying online. So it is a golden opportunity to discover ways to protect yourself online and land. So that's what you can do in Kirkland Strumness. Excellent. Um, so there we go. There's mm. the time. That's on the 20th. So that's, I think, Friday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, and other, available, other events. Other own events if they want to. So, yeah. Other events are available <laughs> where you live. Yeah. Including, so, as you mentioned, Northern Ireland. There we are. Yeah. Okie doke. So, we'll have the link on the YouTube video after yep. the show, and you can pick up um, what, what things are happening where in your area. I love a map. Can you tell? I like a map. Yes. Very good. <laughs> um, easy to do. Anyone can do a map. Yeah. So, moving on. Um, 17th to the 19th of October, uh, this is a global event because, you know, we're not just um, local, we're also global. And this is the Accelerating Digital Equity Global Summit, investing in community-led solutions for social change. And this is organised by the Digital Equity Accelerator, a collaboration between HP, Inc., uh, the Hewlett Packard, and the Aspen Institute. 
We'll convene global leaders across uh, philanthropy, technology, government, international development and social impact to collaborate on ways to close the digital divide in the interest of social and economic justice globally. Um, and as part of this summit, uh, all sorry, all parts of the summit will take place on a fully virtual online interactive platform that enables networking and substantive engagement among attendees. All the events are free and open to the public, however, advanced registration is required. The event aims to highlight the importance of digital inclusion and amplify the work of global impact organizations leveraging technology to provide educational, employment and social opportunities to marginalized and underserved communities, including women and girls, ethnic, racial and religious minority communities, aging populations, people with disabilities and the teachers working with these groups. And the event will take place on the heels of a digital equity accelerator hosted by Asman Digital and uh, Hula Packard, and they hope that attendees can further inspire, connect, and collaborate with feature organizations that will present during the showcase. So wow. um, from kind of local to global, uh, yeah, so well done them, and, and great that it's free and anybody can kind of join in yeah. and see, see what other people are doing around the world. I, th I do think, you know, we've had great stories on here previously in previous seasons of things I didn't know anything about, and I, you know, uh, hopefully it, it helped other people to learn about what was happening in other countries as well that might help, might inspire them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, on Wednesday, the 18th of October, there is a cultural event, Reflect, Share, Inspire, Digital Skills for Heritage. Um, and this is, I think the British Museum is involved in this one, reflecting on the achievements of the Digital Skills for Heritage initiative over the past three years. The panel will share their thoughts on some of the highlights and successes and consider its legacy. And this page uh, kind of goes on and on and on. If you look on the slider on the right-hand side, Swain, you'll see it's very small. So you could, that tells you that, that there's huge numbers of um, oh, yes. events mm. in, in the programs. If you just scroll down briefly, you can kind of keep, keep scrolling um, and see like there's three different things during, um, you know, 12220 and then three more sessions and three more sessions after that. So it's a huge variety um, of, of kind of all kinds of things. And I think even if you weren't involved and in heritage. One very important thing, one strand is always online, it seems. You can't choose if you're online, but there is one that is online e at each stage. So that's great. It's a hybrid yeah. event. Okay, I didn't realize that, but yeah, great. Thanks for picking that up. So yeah, lots to, you know, lots of different things to do. We can all learn things from um, other, uh, you know, the way other groups do things. So um, well done to them for um, offering such a wide variety of um, sessions. Absolutely. Absolutely brilliant. Gosh, I wish mm. you had an assignment to do this week. I would be <laughs> events. <laughs> okay and okay. uh moving on we've got another yeah one more event to cover i think this is one you picked up sway oh, yes uh, never mind the greenwash here's the transition speaking of my assignment mm -hmm. this, this is actually the topic of it I okay uh so this is it's not quite a digital thing but it, it's kind of related um greenwash mm -hmm. the uh the tendency of companies and all of us really to describe as environmentally friendly or good for the environment something which is in fact not very good for the environment or nothing to write home about so um this is a, a seminar a webinar on thursday given by my friend and colleague daniel kenning of splendid engineering it's uh, a little bit tricky to register for you have to um you have to go on to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers website and create yourself a free account and then register. Mm. It's a little bit of a hassle there, but um, it's it's aimed at this is aimed at anyone who's interested in really getting to grips with what we need to do about the realities of climate change. So get beyond the um, you know get get beyond the the marketing nonsense and the 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 lobbying that goes on for certain things that maybe aren't as environmental as you might have thought given the attention that they get so basically uh, all of that stuff is is can be described as greenwashing and uh, daniel's webinar will ask what do we need to do instead of greenwashing um and he says that in the 70s he remembers an awareness that popular music was in a dead end and this explains his um his um his graphic that he's ripped off from the uh, from the uh, Sex Pistols' famous album, mm -hmm. so he's 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 he's, he's um, 
looking back to that and and drawing an analogy between among many people there's an, aw an awareness that popular music was at a dead end and that and then punk rock came along challenged perceived excesses and the corporatization of music shook everything up enabled a new fresh direction and music didn't die and we still have amazing music now whatever your views on punk what he's saying is that the the, the way of going about climate uh sustainability uh that he is advocating is all to do with um is all to do with with you know shaking things up and doing things differently so that's uh that's a seminar that's on um on thursday mm. i believe so that's a bit of a ramble. I have a whole lot of things written out to say about that. Then I couldn't find it. So I just rambled. Is that something you'll be going to yourself? I will be going to that. Yes. Mm, yes. Okay. Um, and and yes, there we are. So we can hear more about it next week. You can yes, report back absolutely. and tell us how it went. Great, 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 great. Um, I've just noticed actually on Twitter, and this is a bit unusual for us to just pick something up randomly. But um, while we're on air, we can <laughs> report that. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel Caldicott um, is calling for proposals for uh, the AI and Society Forum on conference sessions that they're running. Uh, they're due by tomorrow at five o'clock. That's why I'm raising it today. Okay. Um, they're looking for sessions on, for example, AI and climate, justice, migration, health, work, democracy, disinformation and rights. Um, so if you're on Twitter, as I think lots of people still are, including us, um, please find Rachel Caldicott's um, Twitter handle, which is Rachel Caldicott, C-O-L-D-I-C-U-T-T. -T, and uh, she's about community tech and network care and her company is called Care for Trouble. Um, but she's doing lots of great stuff around AI and society, civil society, which I think would be as well worth following up on, especially as um, allows me allows me now to plug the um, uh, UK, tech for, UK and Ireland Tech for Good organizers retreat. I was at last Friday in Manchester and we did a session there on AI. Um, so we know it's a very topical thing that's coming up in lots of places where we are active, um, AI and civil society. Um, and Ed Superior and Ellie Hale are doing great work on that. So um, please do uh, check out, check them out and follow up on that. OK, so um, we will go on to our stories for uh, this this uh, episode. And um, the first one is about tackling data poverty in Leeds. It's a community-based approach to gifting Sims. And we know that Leeds is the only place it's happening, but it's a story from them about it. Okay. And it's video, and I'm not sure how long the Leeds segment lasts, but we'll play it through anyway. Here, here goes. Okay, so digital um, poverty. We wanted to talk about digital poverty in this webinar as part of Leeds Digital Festival because um, it's becoming more and more of an issue as part of um, the cost of living crisis. We see more and more people and families in Leeds and across the UK struggling to be able to afford connectivity, um, which means that they don't have adequate access to the digital tools and resources that they need to be able to um, do things like access healthcare, um, find employment, communicate with other people, um find entertainment all of the things that most people that are probably watching this webinar will take for granted being able to afford connectivity a reliable wi-fi um tariff or page go data has always been a, an issue and it's always been something that's affected those people on lower incomes um the most but as the cost of living crisis has impacted over the last year we've seen more and more families having to choose between keeping up with their Wi-Fi or paying for data and paying other um, essential bills, like paying for food or fuel. According to, um, according to the House of Lords Digital Exclusion report recently, up to a million households, it's thought across the UK, have cut back on their internet packages in the last year, many um, not having internet at all. What that means for Leeds, so it's really difficult for us in a, um, a city to be able to ascertain exactly how many people or households or families don't have or aren't able to afford um, a decent Wi-Fi connection or connectivity without 
surveying everybody and finding out on an individual basis whether they've had to drop their package. What we can say is the number of people that are living on a low income or in poverty across the city. We don't have um, lots of up-to-date 2023 figures, but based on the Leeds Poverty Facts book, the figures that you can see here are all people and families that are likely to be um, struggling to be able to afford Wi-Fi and data, and so are unable to make use of the digital tools and services that will make their lives easier. These groups of people are, are the people that are already most likely to face digital exclusion. So as well as the affordability of connectivity and Wi-Fi, they're also the groups that are most likely to be struggling with some of the other barriers to digital inclusion, including um, having the skills needed to be able to make the um, best use of digital tools and services, having the confidence in their own abilities to be able to engage with digital safely and that digital tools and, and services are safe to use. Um, also having the uh, motivation, understanding the potential personal benefit of engaging with digital if they've not really done much on the internet um, and uh, more use of face-to-face -face services. So 100% digital leads, we address digital inclusion as a whole. We're really invested in digital inclusion because we think digital inclusion is social inclusion. It's about making sure that everybody in the city is able to make the same choice as I have when it comes to deciding whether to use digital tools and services and choosing the best digital tools and services that um, are right for them. There's often an assumption that because people have got access to face-to-face -face services, that that means that they're included, even if they can't get online. And we don't think that's true. Firstly, I have the choice between both options. I think everybody should have that choice. And also there are lots of people who find face, um, accessing tools and services face-to-face -face really difficult. People that have got caring responsibilities, people that find it difficult to move around the city, um, uh, people that have got mental health issues, and we think that everybody should be able to choose how they want to do things and choose the thing that's easiest for them on a certain day. In order to do that, everybody in the city needs to be able to make an informed choice. To be able to make an informed choice, we need to work to make sure that the barriers to digital inclusion have been removed for them. So that people are choosing, if they choose not to use digital tools and services, they're making that choice based on the fact that they have everything open to them. That means that they're able to use those if they wanted to, including the understanding that those digital tools and services are there, that they're there for them to use, and that there would be a potentially a benefit or not to them using them. To be able to do that, everybody in the city needs to have the skills to be able to make use of those digital tools and services. They need to have the confidence that they can do digital and that the digital tools and services available to them are safe and that they won't get scammed or they, or they won't get hacked. We need to make sure that the motivation is there, that everybody understands the personal relevance of digital to them the range of tools and services that are available and how using them um, could benefit them. And then also, as we're here to discuss today, we need to make sure that everybody has the right connectivity. Access to um, good Wi-Fi at home, ideally. Access to good pay-as-you-go, I'm sorry, good um, mobile data. Not having to rely on pay-as-you-go to be able to get that, which is the most expensive way to be able to get data and the, often the least reliable especially when people are thinking about how they um, need to budget and running out of data and making sure that they've got access to the right equipment for them to be able to do what they need to do online. So 100% digital leads, the way that we do this is that we um, are working to build a coordinated and connected digital inclusion ecosystem across leads. So what that means is that we work with hundreds of different delivery partners across the city, lots of different partners that are all already working with and in those communities where people are more likely to be digitally excluded for whatever reason. And we work with those partners to make sure that they have the tools and resources, understanding, knowledge, skills that they need in order to support digital inclusion um, of the people that they work with in the best way for them. We do that because those teams that are working on the ground are supporting pe the people that are more likely to be digitally excluded face-to-face -face every day. They work with them 
um, in a way that means that they really understand everything that they're going through in their lives and all the different barriers that they're facing, not just to digital, but to being able to um, access services more generally. They've also got the specialist understanding and training to be able to um, understand what the people that they're working with really need in terms of support. So we can work with them to develop um, specific interventions that really meet the needs of those people in communities. So 100% digital leads take a community based approach to digital inclusion. We want to make sure that people can get the right support that they need, where they need it and when they need it. Because there are lots of people um, who are very vulnerable that are digitally excluded and people that um, uh, face lots of different barriers to inclusion. We want to make sure that people are getting the support in places where they feel safe in their community as far as possible that that digital inclusion is embedded within the services and places that those people are already um, accessing so they're not being signposted to support someone they don't know or don't feel safe or don't feel comfortable having the conversation that might make them feel vulnerable. We want to make sure that people get that support from someone that they know and trust so that they feel safe and comfortable having that conversation and being really honest about some of the barriers that they're facing and the help that they might need. We want them to be able to get support from people that really understand their situation in a holistic sense, not just digital um, exclusion out on a, on a limb, but embedded within the reality of a person's day to day life and all of the different issues that they might be facing. We want to make sure that people are supported to do the things that are important to them, not just the things that we think that they might benefit from doing or the things that are going to make it easier for other people, but the um, full range of things that is going to help make their life a little bit better so including accessing things like health services and council services we're also talking about staying connected with friends and family um keeping entertained and thinking about how be people can build their confidence um, and skills in a way that's doing things that are really meaningful for them we also want people to be able to learn at the right pace for them so by embedding this support within different organisations, we can make sure that an older person that might have memory issues is being um, supported in a different way to a younger person that might be struggling with um, affordability. And then finally, we want to make sure that people are supported to access the right equipment and activity and, and equipment and connectivity for them. So not just thinking about people having some connectivity or a little bit of connectivity, but thinking about making sure that they've got enough connectivity to do all of the things that are meaningful for them and useful for them um, in, in a sustainable way. So we support the different partners to embed digital inclusion into their offer as a business as usual. So part of that, is a ability to be able to support connectivity is working closely with the national data bank and other data providers so oh, yes that was that's really good that Stunning, was um, amy Hearn, Hearn, who's the digital inclusion manager at 100 percent digital leads um so yeah i mean Stunning. great really to hear really all good. that yeah yeah, yeah. I right. love the bit. I love the theme about um, finding people's motive, people finding their own motivation for accessing services, and quite interesting and and kind of almost pushing back slightly on some things that we say sometimes, which is you know, face to face services with a bit of assistance. Uh, she's kind of saying yes, fair enough, yeah. but also saying <laughs> we need to do more than that, really, and 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 and, um, and really get under the skin of what people's issues and problems actually are and, and try and find a territory where they would be possibly choosing where at least they've got the choice mm. and they know they have the choice to do digital stuff instead of just saying digital's not for me I'm not yeah. going to do that yeah so interesting, absolutely interesting. yeah I um uh, one of the first stories we get to this week uh, further down on on the grid is is about uh, assisted digital. I think that might be a part of that as well. You know, giving people a hand to do what they want to do online or help them to see see what more they can do online. 
Okay. Um. So our next I think, story. Sorry. I think go we'll on, move. Fine. Yes. I, I think we'll skip one and go on to yeah. the World Mental Health Day. Okay. Story. Um. So this was a story we picked up on LinkedIn about <laughs> mistakes comms professionals make when tackling mental health stigma. Um. And we mentioned World Mental Health Day earlier, and um, the uh, advice in this article from um somebody on LinkedIn. Who's the person on LinkedIn? Swain, Ruth, I can't quite see. Ruth. Ruth D- oh, Dale. Oh, yeah. Ruth Dale, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, she's saying that the uh, biggest mistake that pros make, com professionals make when they tackle mental health stigma is, first of all, talking about the stigma, second, writing about the stigma, thirdly, telling everyone about the stigma, <laughs> which normalizes stigma. Instead, uh, she's suggesting that we talk about how to talk, we write about hope, and we tell everyone how to get help. And this was, um, uh, she's quoting uh, what she's calling uh, uh, their latest expert guest, Nadra Klein Weinrich, um, findings from the hugely, hugely successful Take Action for Mental Health campaign, which ran successfully across California. And in the episode that Ruth refers to, she shares the background of the campaign. Uh, Nidra shares the background of the campaign and how they knew that stigma was not the main barrier and discovered that recognizing our own symptoms was the main barrier instead. So the campaign focused on recognition and help seeking. So we um, we give a link to Take Action for Mental Health or the Rand Association uh, to check out the insightful evaluation report. But more importantly, um, Ruth is saying, you know, let's check in with each other and make t- talking and seeking help our new social norm. Checking out the Mental Health Foundation and Every Mind Matters for practical tips too, which we uh, referred to earlier as well. So yeah, no, yeah, more I, great resources. Yeah, I thought that was a good, a good subtle take on something that's quite often that can be a bit run of the mill every year. Mental Health Day, let's reduce stigma, blah blah blah. It's more, there's more to it than that. Uh, yeah. and certainly that thing about a main barrier being recognition of one's own symptoms. I mean, I think we've all probably stumbled over that barrier at times um and it's interesting to see that being picked out as the main the main um theme of that that campaign so that's ruth dale's um podcast which i think um that's what they mean by the latest episode so uh, i think yeah i think ruth is going to join us at comms camp in okay glasgow as well uh, excellent uh, so that'd be good to see her there good 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 chance to pick up maybe some more guests for the program when you're indeed, there in Swain, indeed indeed i will have little cards printed I think. <laughs> obviously with a I'll qr code that. on being digital <laughs> you know it has to be a qr code <clears throat> yes we had a few of those at the um uk <laughs> uk and ireland tech for good organizers retreat um yeah and uh, yeah some of them worked actually quite well so yeah um shout out to ed superior for the civil society ai handbook um which we we got on we got to on, on the QR oh, code. Oh, very good, very good. Yes. Okie doke. Um, the next item was something more we picked up on LinkedIn. We we're we're, we're getting more more and more stories from LinkedIn. I think now this was a gold mm. level badge on digital ethics now live on the IDEA. Um, so the IDEA has partnered up with Digital Extra Fund, a leading Scottish charity supporting extracurricular digital tech activities for young people across Scotland, and the ethical digital. Ethical, this is this is a mouthful. Ethical digital <laughs> nation team at the Scottish government to create a goal level badge on digital, digital ethics is now live on the IDEA, and this badge explores the complexities of digital ethics and how digital innovation provides many benefits to our lives, but can also come with unexpected consequences that we must look out for. You will gain an understanding of what digital ethics is, why it's important, and learn how to think like a dig- digital ethicist. There are eight sections in the badge. Uh, what do you already know about digital ethics? Number one. Number two, the ethical impact of digital innovation. Three, what is the role of a digital ethicist? Four, a guide for thinking like a digital ethicist. Five, connecting digital ethics to organizational values. Six, digital ethics, everyone's job. Everyone has a role to play. Seven, a scenario-based challenge for a tech startup. And eight, finally, reflections on being a responsible digital citizen. So the badge is free and can be accessed by anyone, anywhere, anytime, and any device. And so far this month, and this was probably last month, more than 60,000 new learners have joined IDEA. Well, I think I'm going to apply for that as well, yeah. uh, Swain. So much good stuff this week. That yeah. was two weeks ago. So, yes, it was September. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, mm. I don't, yeah that, that looks really great. I, I yeah. have the, the idea site there, but it looks like lots of other good stuff there too. Mm. Yeah, so let's bookmark that one and come back to it for future More good reference. stuff coming out of historically coming out of local government hooray yeah right 
So the ne next one was something else I didn't know about, the National Digital Inclusion Award. And this is the GRCC, which I think is the Gloucester Regional something council. Have you got the have you got it up on screen, it's Swain? The well, yes, I do, but I'm not sure I can see what it stands for. Uh, uh, com community, community action, action in Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire. Yes, anyway. I just see that. <laughs> <sighs> um and this is um the Organisations have been delighted to be short, have been shortlisted for the UK Digital Inclusion Award run by ISPA, the Internet Service Providers Association, the Good Things Foundation and the tech company TP Link. Um, and the quote is that access to re reliable, good quality technology and being equipped with the skills to be able to make the most of our digitally connected world are no longer luxuries. They're essential for all of us, stated IPSA. The current cost of living crisis and woes about economic security have created an increased demand for initiatives that contribute towards digital connectivity and supply of technology for all. And the work uh, by GRCC is led by the Digital Inclusion Manager, Dan Gale, who runs the DAISY project. And he, Dan says, it's an honor to have our groundbreaking digital inclusion work recognized at a national level. This has only been possible thanks to the hard work of my GRCC colleagues and our partner organizations and the generosity of our sponsors. And the work to improve, improve digital inclusion in Gloucestershire has inc included the following. And I'm going to read them out because it's handy to have a list of um, what people have done and other, uh, others might also learn from. So they've taught web design skills to local visually impaired people. They provided cyber security training for deaf people um, working with Gloucestershire Deaf Association. They've set up 12 digital hubs and 10 digital safe spaces around the co county. They've enabled social prescribers to provide access to nature for housebound people using drones. They've distributed over 8,000 SIM cards, giving free calls and data, providing them at food banks and other community support hubs, working with the Vodafone Foundation. And finally, they provide, they provide a regular supply of refurbished laptops and Chromebooks, community groups and charities working with ITSA Digital Trust. So a great variety of activities there to improve digital inclusion in Gloucestershire. So well done to GRCC and whether or not they win the um, win the National Digital Inclusion Award, um, we think they've done great work and we salute them. Absolutely. Did I share that screen at all when you were saying all that? No, I don't think you did. I don't think I did. No, no, oh well, no. the link will be in so, the uh, in the usual place in the <laughs> YouTube. Yeah, yes. absolutely. And our next story is um, from Switzerland. The um, this is a story entitled "Visually Impaired Demand E-Voting in Switzerland." That's visually impaired people, and this is um, a story about the Swiss Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and it's called for the immediate introduction of electronic voting to eliminate discrimination against the blind in exercising voting and election rights. The lack of digital accessibility excludes hundreds of thousands of handicapped people, the association said in Bern last month. Obviously, the language is in the article, sorry. So we're sorry if, if that offends um, disabled people, but it's what they, they've used in their um, article. Um, it goes on to say, digitalization has arrived in almost all areas of life and is, poly is de developing rapidly. The SBV at, at their media conference, digital products and content may be, must be just as accessible as physical ones. Um, and they're saying that, you know, just the lack of accessibility, many products cannot be used independently or only with difficulty. And this was the interesting thing that jumped out at me, Swain. This contradicts both the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, ratified by Switzerland in 2014, and the 2004 Disability Equality Act. So that was in Switzerland. But the UN Convention is an international one, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So um, um, I haven't seen that quoted before in no. challenging people about accessibility of services. So um, I think that's one we'll we'll hear more about in the future. I think I think it's it's the usual thing with with international treaties. There is this treaty in the background, and we'll find um, no doubt that many countries have improved their own laws, like Switzerland have in two thousand and four, like the UK started to do in two thousand and five based on their ratification of a, of a treaty. So the treaty will set some principles and then each country will then have its own updated, improved rules and regulations to so that they are in conformance with the treaty. But if there are... So there's always two arguments to be had about accessibility. One is something inaccessible under the law of the country that you're in. Yes or no, maybe. Maybe you need a court case. The other, the other question that can be had, it's more of a political question, is are the laws in a specific country, do they conform to the nation's 
obligations under the international treaty. So those are two different things. Uh, but certainly, if something um, if something isn't in isn't in com isn't in com isn't doesn't agree with the UN Convention, then there's a good argument to say either it's illegal in the country or that the law doesn't work. Mm-hmm. It can so be I think challenged. Was, so yeah, yeah. I think that's what's. I think, mm-hmm. and and it's it's interesting to see another country going through that. I mean, we've had all of these debates in in well in the various parts of uh, the UK. I can't remember whether whether disability ac- accessibility stuff is is devolved or not. I don't think it is. I think it's UK level. Mm. Um. So yeah, we've had all these discussions, and you know, I I'm I can be known to drop the idea of accessibility to accessibility to events into this kind of conversation as well as mm. all the other services uh, it's not too hard now it's kind of mm-hmm. reasonable a yep. reasonable adjustment to your event to make some kind of hybrid option mm-hmm. possible you might yep. argue yeah you may so it's the Swiss are organizing this campaign and uh, we'll we'll look out for more developments on that um and they're launching an awareness campaign for the full population, focusing on business and politics. Um, and they're saying only if accessibility is considered for the outside can it succeed. So, um, yeah, we we hope they do well in that. So the next one was a um, a survey, and the deadline is the twentieth. So again, this is not something I wanted to get in in our in our program today. It's a survey of practitioners on digital learning from refugees and forcibly displaced populations that I spotted on Twitter. And it says that education cannot wait, ECW, the United Nations Refugee Agency and the Geneva Global Hub for Education in Emergencies are collaborating on a state of play report on digital inclusion investments, initiatives and impact for refugees and displaced populations. The report will provide an overview of the refugee connected education challenge, partner led other and other relevant stakeholders, investments and initiatives promoting digital inclusion for refugees and displaced populations and review current status and gaps against education commitments of the RCEC and Global Refugee Forum. This survey will inform the development of the report with expertise from practitioners working in a wide range of locations and a diversity of roles. They're not going to quote any individual organization in the report without obtaining explicit permission, but they are asking people to complete the report. They say it'll take approximately, the survey, sorry, the survey should take approximately 20 minutes and the deadline for completing it is is this week, Friday, October 20th, 2023. So if you work with refugees and or forcibly displaced populations um, and you want to comment on digital inclusion for those uh, groups, then please do uh, complete this survey. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So great, good one. Okay, I think we've got time for uh, one more story before we close. Um, so have you got a, have you got a preference there, Swain? No, just crack on. No. <laughs> okay. Um, let's do the next one. Then that was the UN calling calling for closing internet connectivity and digital governance gap. Um, and they are, uh, this is from the 18th Interna- Annual Internet Governance Forum, hosted by the Government of Japan under the overarching theme, The Internet We Want, em- uh, Empowering All People. Um, and they're saying, considering the rapid tech-, tech advances, including in artificial intelligence, risking exacerbating existing inequalities, the forum focuses on how we leverage the benefits of digital technologies while mitigating the risks. Um, While technology is moving at warp speed in a select group of countries, the reality is that 2.6 billion people are still offline, mostly in the global south and vulnerable communities. Um, And it goes on to say, have more messages about digitalization being a whole of society phenomenon, uh, the need to work together to close the gap and reinforce a human centered right to um, approach to digital cooperation. So um, good news from the UN and we, we, we hope we contribute to that in our own way. Uh, one final story, Swain. I'm going to I'm going to um, uh, elbow it in, and that's the digi- our friends at Digital Unite are winners. Uh, they were they won the Learning Pool Live Judges Award for special contribution for the Digital Champions Network for creative use of the platform to deliver social digital social impact. So congratulations to Digital Unite for all the great work that they do, um, and all the other winners of the Learning Pool uh, Awards, but. Um, especially Digital Unite. Especially our friends at Digital Unite. Yes, yeah, that's really absolutely. well Absolutely. And it's good to see Learning Pool, who I've been aware of for many, many, many years now, because um, their former, uh, but their founder came to a Scottish Gov camp uh, from ah. Northern Ireland. 
Mary McKenna. Years and years, Mary McKenna yes. herself. Yeah. Yep. Uh, years and years ago uh, in Aberdeen, and that's uh, so I've been kind of keeping an eye on Landing Pool ever since, really. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, same here, and it's where it's how I first met Paul Webster, who I cooperated with to organise VCSS camp. Um, and I've met Mary's, of course, since um, at various things, including the Irish Embassy in London at a reception. Oh, wow. So name there dropping there. But yeah, ho, ho, ho. yeah. No, she's doing great work <laughs> now back in Ireland with yep. Awaken Hub um, for uh, social entrepreneurship for women, especially. So she, she's one of these people who, who if you if you turn away your attention for three or four weeks, she's doing something else again. <laughs> new. <laughs> very, very versatile. <laughs> So that brings us to the end of today's show. Um, thank you for joining us. If you have um, someone you'd like to be a guest, if you'd like to be a guest yourself or a story you'd like us to cover, please do contact the show. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, but until next week, take care and have a great week. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.